bacterial cells. And the reason for this is most of you have had or will have two semesters of anatomy and physiology where you focus on humans, which are eukaryotes. So we're going to spend most of our time talking about um, bacteria. So these are just some of the characteristics of cells. Um, we've talked about how all cells can synthesize a cytoplasmic membrane, also known as a cell membrane. Um, or a plasma membrane. All cells have ribosomes. Ribosomes um, are where protein synthesis occurs. Cells carry out metabolism, both anabolism, biosynthesis, and catabolism. Cells grow and divide. And again, these are just some of the characteristics of cells. Now, remember we said that viruses and prions are not cells. We said they're acellular. And if I asked you for proof, you could just run down this list, starting at the top, and just say, well, Viruses and prions cannot synthesize a cell membrane. It can't synthesize a cytoplasmic membrane. Uh, viruses and prions lack ribosomes. Viruses and prions do not carry out metabolism. Viruses and prions don't grow and divide. So again, these are just some, some um, data supporting our statement that prions and viruses are not cells. So just a, a refresher again, folks. Um, we want to remember that we use this um, um, phylogenetic tree of life, which shows us the relationships between all cellular organisms. And so you'll recall that all cellular organisms we, were descended from the last universal common ancestor, Luca, about 3.8 billion years ago. And as time progressed through natural selection, we had diversification of life, um, this great process of biological evolution. And you'll recall that um, we now know cellular organisms are divided into three big domains. Two of the domains contain prokaryotes, so domain bacteria, domain archaea, and the other domain contains the eukaryotes. And also recall, according to the endosymbiotic theory, mitochondria, eukaryotic mitochondria evolved from primitive aerobic respiring bacteria, and also eukaryotic chloroplasts evolved from primitive endosymbiotic cyanobacteria. And we'll see that the, um, that, that the structures um, of the mitochondria and the, excuse me, the, the mitochondria and chloroplasts support this hypothesis. So as we said, we're going to focus primarily on prokaryotic cells, primarily on bacteria. So recall that pro means before, carrion, the suffix means nut or kernel. And as biologists, the nut or kernel we're interested in is the nucleus. So prokaryotes, they're unicellular, they lack a membrane-bound nucleus, and they also lack other membrane-bound organelles. For example, they lack, they do not have mitochondria nor chloroplasts. Our two domains, archaea and bacteria, and we're going to focus on bacteria. So often I'll write members of domain bacteria with a little b. Apologies for the poor quality of this slide. Um, this, is gonna, this is a diagram of a generic bacterial cell. Um, and I'll pass out a similar diagram to you all in lecture. Um, and just a heads up, you guys, I'll try to let you know which diagrams will be on lecture exam one, or, or diagrams that will be similar to the ones that we have, that we discuss in lecture. And as you might imagine, what I can do with these diagrams is white out, blank out the um, text. And for example, maybe label different parts of our cell with letters and then have you identify the name and the function and the composition of the different labeled parts. So that's, that's kind of classic on our first lecture exam. So really quickly, folks, I, I just want to go through our generic bacterium, and then the rest of the bacterial slides will just be giving a little bit more detail. So you might want to use colored pencils to color at least the different layers here because it can get confusing. So this layer right here, is the cytoplasmic membrane, also um, can be called the cell membrane or plasma membrane. And um, you might recall that we said the model for cell membranes is a fluid mosaic model in which we have an ocean, a phospholipid bilayer, kind of like the consistency of olive oil, with um, membrane proteins kind of floating in that ocean of oil. Probably the most important job of the cytoplasmic cell membrane is to control movement of what moves into the cell and what moves out of the cell. And very importantly, we want to remember anything that damages the cell membrane is usually fatal to the, the cell. And we'll see we can use that to our advantage when we want to kill pathogenic bacteria. Now, most members of domain bacteria, not all, but most of them, outside of the cell membrane, 
most bacteria will make a strong cell wall. And the major purpose of the cell wall is to help prevent a process call, called osmotic lysis, which we'll be describing. So the cell wall has to be really strong, and the, um, the, the uh, component within bacterial cell walls that provides strength is called peptidoglycan. Right? And we're going to come back and talk lots and lots about peptidoglycan. And the reason is if we can somehow weaken the peptidoglycan, that will weaken the bacterial cell wall, and then the bacteria will die from osmotic lysis. And again, if we have a pathogenic bacteria growing in our patients, we want to kill those bacteria. So we're going to see we have some antibiotics that will interfere with peptidoglycan synthesis, and as a result, we can kill the bacteria. So again, we'll, we'll come back and talk quite a bit about that. This outermost layer in here, the, the artist labeled it as a capsule. I would like you to use a more general term initially and call this the glycocalyx. It literally means sugar cup. And so this, this kind of uh, carbohydrate outer coating, which many bacteria have, some lack it, but some do have it, um, there's two different types depending on how well organized they are and how tightly adherent they are to the surface of the bacterium. So the first one we'll talk about is a capsule. These are usually well organized, tightly adherent to the surface of the bacterium. And the, uh, a really important job of the capsule is to protect the bacterium from being phagocytized by host leukocytes. Now just imagine this is a bacterium that's invading our body. Um, our leukocytes will be drawn to the site of bacterial invasion and our phagocytic cells, our neutrophils and our macrophages will try to um, attach to ingest through the process of phagocytosis the invading bacteria and try to kill them. But the challenge is for our phagocytes to attach to the bacteria um, before the phagocytes can ingest them, phagocytize them, our phagocytes have to have have to have um, surface molecules that can bind to this outermost layer. And for some interesting reason, um, animal phagocytic cells never evolved receptors to bind to these capsules. And usually, again, the capsules are usually made out of polysaccharide, usually repeating, repeating units of, of um, monosaccharides linked together. So again, um, our leukocytes, our phagocytic cells, don't have receptors to bind to the what we call the encapsulated bacteria, and that permits the bacterium to escape. It avoids phagocytosis. So one uh, really good description of a bacterial bacterial capsule is it's antiphagocytic, and we'll come back and talk more about that. Now the second type of glycocalyx is called a slime layer. It's more loosely organized. It's more loosely attached to the surface of the bacterium. And we'll see that those slime layers are, play a really important role in helping bacteria to stick to surfaces in their environment. Um, and, and, and indeed, if they invade humans, they can uh, use their slime layers to, to stick to surfaces in our bodies. And the, the classic one we'll discuss is when they stick to our teeth. And there they can start growing and multiplying. If we eat a diet high in sugar, they make more slime layer. Other, other bacteria get stuck into that slime layer and then they start growing on our teeth. And pretty soon we have a community of bacteria living in this sticky, what they call ex, um, extracellular polymeric substance, EPS. And that's, that creates what we call a biofilm on our teeth that eventually can develop into plaque. And we'll be talking about how um, harmful that can be. And indeed, in, um, in lab, in Unit 8, we're going to be harvesting biofilm from your teeth, plaque, plaque from your teeth, and gram staining it so we can see all the bacteria living, living in that biofilm. All right, so, so we've gone from the cytoplasmic membrane to the cell wall and then out to the uh, glycocalyx. So now let's go and check out these little hair-like filaments here. And we can see there's um, there's three different types. Here's one. This is called a fimbria. It's going to be used for attachment to surfaces. And again, if this was an invasive bacterium, there'd be special proteins at the tip of the fimbria called adhesins that could bind to complementary surface receptors on our cells so that the, the bacterium won't get washed away. Say in um, if the bacterium wants to live in the intestine, they could use their fimbria to attach to our intestinal epithelial cells. If a bacterium invades our bladder, they could use their fimbria to attach to the, um, the, the bladder epithelial cells. And then here we have uh, another 
um, hair-like projection. Um, this is called the sex pillus or conjugation pillus. Um, it's made of protein, as is the fimbria. The fimbria is made of protein. All these hair-like filaments are all made of protein. And the sex pillus we're going to see is involved in a really amazing process um, called conjugation between bacteria. And in conjugation, um, let's say this is our bacterium. Um, this would be considered a donor bacterium because it has the genes to make the sex pillus. This donor bacterium would use a sex pillus to attach to another bacterium in the environment, that, and that bacterium would be the recipient. And then through this cool process, the donor bacterium can transfer a copy of, of um, the donor's DNA to the recipient. And we'll see this could be, for example, transfer of antibiotic resistance plasmids. We can see in some cases the donor can uh, transfer at least uh, part of a copy of its chromosome. And the reason we're so worried about that process is this conjugation is a great way for bacteria to spread their antibiotic resistance genes. The third um, protein filament that we see ex extending from the surface of the cell, this is called... Um, a single one would be a flagellum, or more than one is flagella. And these um, flagella can rotate like a boat propeller. And just like a boat propeller, they can help move the bacterium through uh, its liquid environment. There are different arrangements of flagella. Um, we'll have a slide on the different arrangements, but you won't have to, you won't have to um, describe the different flagella arrangements on the lecture exam. That's usually something we discuss in lab and it will be a lab exam question. Okay, so we've gone the outside of the cell, so now let's go into the cell, you guys, this interior, the cytoplasm, rich in water and ions and nutrients and waste products and then these other cool structures. So this little squiggle here that looks like a piece of tangled spaghetti, this is the bacterial um, chromosome. And I th possibly had mentioned before that usually bacteria have a single circular chromosome which is quite different from us humans. We have multiple linear chromosomes, right? And so the, um, the chromosomal DNA encodes the information for all the proteins, all the enzymes that the cell will need. Now, some bacteria, in addition, will have, this looks like almost like a little mini chromosome. Um, this is a plasmid, and it carries extra genetic information, such as antibiotic resistance genes. And if plasmids carry um, antibiotic resistance genes, they're often referred to as R plasmids or resistance plasmids. And the bad news is they can carry genes for resistance against five, six, seven different antibiotics. And bacteria can make copies of their plasmids and then share those copies with other bacteria, for example, through conjugation. These little dot, dot, dots are meant to, um, to represent the ribosomes, the sites of protein synthesis in our bacterium. And we want to remember that bacteria and archaea, all prokaryotes, have 70 S ribosomes. Now, this is, is how we talk about the size of ribosomes. Um, S is for Svedberg unit, and for right now we'll just say it indicates size. And very important for us to remember is that we eukaryotes, we have larger 80 S ribosomes in our cytoplasm. And you might say, well, who cares? Well, it turns out that 70 S ribosome, that's a great great target for antibiotics, right? So um, we're going to see a number of our antibiotics are going to bind to the bacter bacterial 70S ribosome and shut down protein synthesis. The final little structure over here, folks, this little oval structure, this is supposed to indicate an endospore. Endospores are tough resistant structures, and luckily only some bacteria can make them. The bacteria we'll be looking at in lab that can make endospores um, belong to the genus Bacillus, so for example, Bacillus anthracis that causes anthrax, and then an, another big genus of endospore-producing bacteria, the genus Clostridium. There's many pathogens that belong to this genus, so for example, Clostridium tetani causes tetanus, Clostridium botulinum cause, causes botulism, um, Clostridium difficile, right, C. diff, um, can cause what's called a pseudomembranous colitis and can be lethal in, in some people. And we'll see, folks, that these um, endospores, they're so tough and resistant, if this, the parent bacterium dies and breaks open and releases the endospore into the environment, the endospores can remain infectious for decades, centuries, some people think even thousands of years. And furthermore, the endospores, the, the coating is so tough, our gram stains won't penetrate. So when we gram stain cells, we'll see the endospores usually don't gram stain, 
The endospores are totally resistant to antibiotics. They're resistant to a lot of disinfectants and antiseptics. They'll resist drying in the environment. Um, our phagocytes, it's really hard for our phagocytes to destroy these, these endospores. But the good news is normal autoclaving will destroy bacterial endospores. So that's good news for us. And I think, folks, what we'll do is I'll stop there. I'll try to break um, this PowerPoint up into smaller chunks. So we'll just stop there with that overview. And then the next part, we'll just go over the same structures just in a little bit more detail.